are rolling and we uh, I got a little carried away and jumped into the jumped in the conversation so those of you at home just go ahead and go over the uh, powerpoints and the uh, lessons and you'll have there for you the basics of what we are talking about but right now we're talking about some other themes that I don't cover and uh, John Ali suggested that one of the themes in the books is this clash between the Old South and the New South. She brought up two very important things that we need to talk about in terms of the background of the book. Uh, it being set in the 1970s in Louisiana, I was sort of struck when I was researching it that nobody had done a paper about um, this novel and about Gill's character. Uh, about salt and pepper against the backdrop of SEC football because we're dealing with Louisiana State. We're dealing with a football game. And Gill is a, a star player. He's the white guy known and nicknamed Salt. And he's uh, uh, in a partnership. We're on a team with a guy named Cal whose nickname is Pepper, Salt and Pepper. Does anybody know when the SEC was segregated or desegregated? It was only a few years before this novel was set. If this novel was set in 78 or 79, it was not until 71, 72 uh, that most of the SEC was, was uh, desegregated. In other words, if you were a black football player, all the way up through the 60s, chances are you played, at least in the South, you weren't recruited by LSU or University of Mississippi or University of Alabama. You can go out and you can find tons of books about the season that Bear Bryant desegregated the University of Alabama. It's a huge controversy. And you know why he did it? It wasn't because he was big on desegregation. He did it because other teams were doing it and he was at a competitive disadvantage. Right? So that's one of the legacies uh, you know, and it affects all aspects of life, of popular culture, sports, entertainment. Desegregation usually happens because there is something of that segregated culture that the dominant culture wants. And that's what helps make it crumble. Okay, so I think a great research paper would be to go and you know put the put the uh, football subplot against the background of of the SEC and the desegregation of it in the 70s, and see what you come up with. Look at look at how these characters. Uh, look at how Gaines uses football mania in the South as a way of promoting that racial inter interdependence that we say is one of, the, one of the big themes of the book. The other issue that John Lee brings up and it's referenced throughout the book is this idea of the necktie party in the South, lynching. Oddly enough, in the history of the South, lynching was not at all common during the slave period. And it really wasn't all that common, even in Reconstruction. When it became common was from about the 1890s forward. And it was done largely as a way of terrorizing blacks, of reinforcing those standards of, of, or of segregation that the laws were beginning to loosen up on. Uh, it's often estimated when you look at estimates of how many lynchings there were in the South or when they hit their when they hit their peak. It was usually considered to hit their peak in the 20s, about the time that the Ku Klux Klan was reestablished. Although the Klan was reestablished in Indiana of all places, it definitely came down and rerouted itself in the South. All right, and that sort of act. Uh, really went on, became less and less rare after, after the 30s, although you have fam very famous civil rights cases where they're not uh, where uh, 
blacks are not necessarily lynched, but they're killed. Okay. But the lynching is a very powerful symbol in the South. How many of you have ever heard the, the uh, song Strange Fruit? Old blue standard. It was written in the 30s, recorded by Billie Holiday. Strange Fruit is the idea of looking up in the trees and seeing right? These, these victims of the lynchings. Just a few days ago, there was, it was the 100th anniversary of a, uh, one of the most famous lynchings in the South. It was not of a African American, it was of a Jewish man named Leo Frank, who was accused of uh, molesting a young girl at a pencil factory. In almost all of these cases of lynching, people have been able to go back and sort of establish that a lot of these crimes were wrongfully, you know, they were wrongfully accused. Certainly most of the black men that were lynched were lynched because there was some fear that they had insulted a white woman. There's usually a sexual element to, uh, to this. So lynching is a huge thing, and it's clear from the way that it's discussed that 30 years ago, 30 years before the novel, 40 years ago, that uh, the, that Fix's family, if not Fix himself, was involved in this, right? This is how this white population sees dominance over the folks living in the quarters, okay? So what's New South about it? The, like you said, the, what is it? Racial interdependence okay. feels sort of like, you know, we can't do this anymore. It's not like that anymore. We agreed to the law. Right. And even his brother, who owns like a butcher shop, I mm -hmm. think, he was like, you know, I'm not going to get involved in this. Yeah. So I think that's sort of stepping away from the idea of like, what do you say, vigilanteism okay. and leaving it to proper authorities. Right. The idea of not using these issues as an excuse. Right. Um, what other forms of the New South do you see in it? What about the relationship between Candy Marshall and the residents of the quarters? Mm, that's why I want. Okay, go oh, ahead, Tia. Uh, that sense of community, like from at the very beginning when she comes and, and says, uh, I, need, I need help mm -hmm. and, and uh, call. Uh, call it's Jamie called so and so, and, and they just they didn't uh, hesitate. They right. all got together. Yep. Well, they're all living on her land. Keep in mind. So part of what's going on here is that there there's a very interesting relationship between Candy and these people. You know, we know that she's an orphan. Her parents were killed in a car wreck, and we're told that essentially she was raised by two people one of whom is sort of the white woman who taught her all the ways of being a woman, Miss Merle, but the other is Matthew, right? The old black man who's going to now claim to be the one who killed Bo. All right? And the relationship between this 30-year-old white woman and this 70-year-old black man is really at the core of the book. Um, I think Gaines does something very complex with that relationship. On the one hand, we see, as Tia says, how you know this whole community arises out of this. They have a lot of affection for Candy. She has a lot of affection for them. Uh, she's protecting them by claiming that she killed Bo, right? She's very concerned about, uh, you know, protecting them from Fix and from his family, right? Uh, but at the same time, she's still their landlord. And at one point, the men actually shut her out toward the end of the meeting. They tell her to stay out. And she's furious. And she actually pulls the landlord card. Get off my land if you're not going to let me do this. Right? So I think in in the relationship, you know, it's always a question of why do why do writers 
make the choices they do. Why do we even need candy in the book? Can't we just have, you know, this this relationship or this conflict between the old men and the sheriff? Why do we need this uh, the woman in there? Well, we need it because we need we need in a sense a critique of what we might call white liberalism, right? Kind of the patrician idea of the South protecting blacks, whether from whites or from each other. And I think part of what this narrative shows is that these black men and Matthew in particular get to the point get to the point where they essentially say, we don't need candy. Right? We don't need her to protect us. We are men, we can protect ourselves. Okay. So She's there, I think, to dramatize, again, a sort of vision. I don't want to say condescending because that sounds a little negative, but it is a type of relationship with between whites and African Americans. The word we'd probably use is patrician, right? Sort of, uh, it's a benevolent form of racism, right? You kind of see it going around a lot these days, right? when Hillary Clinton is going to teach young African-American protesters the proper way to be heard, you know, that should make us a little bit uncomfortable, right? But, um, so we have all varieties of, uh, and maybe, uh, I'm not a big fan of the term white, white privilege, but that's kind of what she represents in the book. Okay. All right. Um, Let's just kind of go through some of the some of the issues or some of the scenes as they pop up. Um, one of the things that I was really trying to figure out as I was going through the book, you know, I kind of got right away that these old men were going to become men with a capital M by the end of the book. And we'll kind of go back through and talk about why they're standing up to uh, Fix and his family at this stage and what the Cajuns represent to the Creoles. The scene I could not figure out, why is this in the book, was at the bar. Remember when the uh, thugs go to the bar and they're going to, you know, get ready for some vengeance by getting drunk first. And they go in this bar. It's told from the, the bar owner's perspective, right? And who do these white guys run into at the bar? Who's there at the bar? Quiet young man. Okay. Well, one, they, they run into two other men, one of whom is Uncle Jack, right, who's part of the Marshall family, right? And Jack is what? Basically drunk at the bar. Right? In a, in a book that's about masculinity, he's, n he's not really helping Candy out a lot by hanging out in this bar, is he? He's kind of avoiding it. But isn't that kind of stereotypical? Okay. In what way? Explain that. Well, he's avoiding confrontation. Sure. Certainly it's going to be a confrontation that has to do with... Um, race mm -hmm. and he leaves candy in the lurch right so that's kind of the the weaker brother um who, who just can't deal yeah okay and Definitely. the richer tend to have that okay they're scared his his you know he's the elite class and he's scared he's scared of what these thugs are going to do but as y'all mentioned we run into somebody else at the bar. This is why I like this novel. Who stands up to these thugs? It's an English professor, right? He's at the bar smoking his pipe. With a cape. With a cape, right? Teaches black literature, right? I could be this guy on my way home from work tonight. Right? Go find a redneck bar. <laughs> 
right? Based on this, I would advise against it. Probably so. <laughs> Probably so. Why is he in this book? The voice of the new South. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And and what's his what's he saying in here? That it's not okay to be a redneck. Okay. Yeah, I think he's here to show us that there is a population that is tired of that type of white person, right? That isn't going to stand for it, right? He even says to Jack, it's people like us, you and I, who pay for this, right? We pay for this. We pay for this violence. Okay. Um, and he says on his way out, I'll leave with these parting words. Don't do it. For the sake of the South, for salt and pepper, don't do it. So you hit him hard where they really get it. So yeah. you attack the whole football thing. <laughs> these Joes are going to be in on the deal. Um you know, the whole football thing is fascinating because you will have, uh, there are people in the South. I, I'm going to say something here, and I'm going to assume everybody will not disagree with me, but, you know, we still have some racism in the South, right? Still, still exists. So you'll have people who are not for necessarily or who think, you know, we've had enough of the civil rights talk and all of that, who are tremendous football fans, which is fine. That's not a contradiction in itself. But one of the first things I ever learned, one of the first jokes I ever heard in White Montgomery was on a football, was about football Saturdays, where you could be in the posh homes of elite Montgomery, and you would hear the excited Scarlett O'Hara types screaming at the TV. And what do you think they're screaming? Run, blank, run. That was kind of a running joke in the upper class of the South. There's a guy who teaches in Tennessee who has a very funny story about a parrot. He was from Mobile. So he has a story about this guy who runs a hotel in the South, and that's what the parrot, say, the parrot says all the time because he's picked it up from watching or from overhearing whites watching football on Saturdays. Okay. So, um, I don't know how I got in oh, talking about the football, but for the sake of the football, yeah. But this whole uh, conversation, again, it really struck me because one of the things that we're doing here, you know, if you're if you're ever a creative writer and, and Gaines taught creative writing for you know 20 years at at, uh, at Southern Louisiana, one of the first things most creative writing teachers say is don't introduce new characters who aren't relevant to the plot. Well, that's kind of bogus because all sorts of writers do that. In fact. The form of this novel is something that it's very much influenced by Faulkner, who did this a lot. Uh, we'll see it a little bit next week, but more so in... How many of you ever had to read As I Lay Dying in high school? Was that? Okay. Well, both As I Lay Dying and Absalom, Absalom are books that are essentially told each chapter from a different perspective of the character. And that's, that's what I like about it. Yeah, that's what he's doing here. As I tell you in the notes, this is what's often called a dialogic novel. D-I-A-L-O-G-I-C. As opposed to a monologic. Last week we read a monologic novel. That was a first person, single narrator novel. One voice. Even though Joe had a lot of different voices going on, it's still one person's voice. A dialogic novel is considered a combination of many voices that get heard throughout the novel. And at the extreme is a novel like this where essentially every chapter is narrated by somebody else. And the story is kind of passed along. Okay? 
one of the ways that one of the effects of that is we see the story from very different angles, right? But we get this instance for for this chapter anyway, where a very peripheral character. I mean, really, does T. Jack have anything to do with this plot? This bar owner? What's his role in it? He just sort of like represents society kind of in a way because he's talking okay. about like that room in the bar. Yeah. That used to be for segregation, but right. now he, they won't come in and use it. They want to actually sit in the bar. But right. He still separates them. Yeah. So it's the idea of like, oh, you know, we've had desegregation, but not really. Yeah. He's kind of your everyday Southerner in a sense. Somebody who's willing to tolerate the status quo. He's not out to change anything. In fact, would like to avoid the hassles. Just to get by. Just to get by. Yeah. But he's and also not with the mob guys either. No. He's afraid of them too. He's, he's afraid of them. In between, kind of. He wants, he just wants to be left alone. He's the person that doesn't want to have to deal with these social problems. Right? So, and you're exactly right. It's actually a very funny chapter. You know, one of the details that I thought was hilarious was he, you know, the, the you know, he insults the guy and has to give them the first round free. And as he's putting out the uh, bowl of ice, right, you notice that they're reaching their hands in there and it gets everything filthy. And he's like, these guys have not bathed in, you know, ages, right? Um, but And I think we're meant to see his sort of cowardice as humorous. You know, he's scared of getting caught up in the middle of this, in the, you know, getting caught up in the mob. So... You know, there's a lot of interesting ways uh, when you're writing a dialogic novel to to depict the action from the side, so you're not looking at it uh, directly. I think you could argue that a good hunk of the characters, many of the uh, black men that we're hearing from, are not necessarily relevant to the action either. I mean, we start off this novel from the point of view of who's our first narrator? Snookum. Snookum, the kid. We get a little kid. Now, if this were Faulkner's book, he'd make the kid, like, mentally handicapped or crazy. You know, and As I Lay Dying has a kid narrator who thinks his mother's a fish. Right? He kind of goes bonkers. Right? That's Falk the most famous chapter in Faulkner. One sentence. My mother is a fish. Right? That's the whole chapter. Makes no sense, but that's a point of view, right? So, uh, you know, we get all these different characters. We go from Snookum to who's? Did anybody remember the second one? Miss Janie. Janie. I have Janie. Them down, so okay. Ah, uh, you got them all in order yeah. there. Miss Janie, who's the housekeeper from the Marshalls, right? And you notice how the difference in the voices is meant to give us sort of different perspective. What's Janie's sort of point of view represent? The panicking one. The, well, the panicking. <laughs> but she's also the religious one, right? Because everything is a prayer. I mean, notice how often her narration stops in order for prayer to happen, right? Makes it kind of hard to actually get through, right? But uh, if you look at page 11, right? Half glass of watered whiskey on the banister by the swing. Lord Jesus, I thought to myself, it ain't even evening yet. He's already drunk. Lord Jesus, help me. Lord Jesus, I thought to myself. There's a lot of humor in this book, by the way. For a novel that's as serious as this is, right? There's a lot of funny stuff in here, too. And it's poetic. Okay. And he'll use the same phrase over and over again. It's okay. like a therapist who will say the same thing three times in a row to make sure you get it. All right. But it, it just it kind of draws musicality into it. For well, me. and that's a good point because there are a lot of articles that analyze the style of this novel and talk specifically about the musicality of the language and the musicality of the conversation. One of the other things we ought to note about this novel is it's very dialogue-driven. Okay. A lot of this book is dialogue, and Gaines has said he's much more of a dialogue writer than he is like a scene describer, 
even though this, as important, it's an odd statement to make for somebody who's for whom setting is really important, right? It's, for whom setting is essential. I mean, he's got to describe the quarters, he's got to describe the cemetery, but he'd rather put all of that in the voice of his characters, have his characters say it to the reader rather than, you know, the kind of traditional, you know, camera lens narrator who's not a character in the book. Right. Who are some of the other narrators that jumped out at you? Some of the other ones. Lou Dodds. Okay. Lou's an interesting presence in the book. I kind of I kind of thought he was a little off to the action too, right? He's the journalist, right? Works in Baton Rouge. Candy's boyfriend, right? But he doesn't really seem relevant to the story. And yet he gets the final chapter. Interesting in a book about black men reclaiming their masculinity. Who's the last voice we hear? A white guy. What is his narration supposed to represent for us? <coughs> I wrote the same thing you just said. And I was like, of course, if we're having a story about black people. For some reason, we have to have a white narrator be the most frequent one in the whole story. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's you know I think it's a problem that you know that uh, at this period of time, only 30 years ago, uh, a lot of black writers still felt. You will go and find essays or criticism about this book where they talk about because Lou is a journalist, he's our objective reporter, right? He sort of presents us the scene. So he's, in a sense, supposed to be our camera, right? Our vision. And the idea is, I think, for most readers, for most of Gaines's readers, for most of the readers of this novel, proportionally, going to be more whites than African Americans, right? That he's giving us a voice or a perspective that we would naturally trust or accept as reality. Now, is that a good or bad thing? Well, you know, that's, I think it's really debatable in a lot of ways. Um, notice whose voices don't narrate any of these chapters. Who's missing in here? Candy. Candy. We never hear Candy. We never, she is not the narrator of one of these chapters. Okay. Now you could argue that that's Gaines kind of silencing this sort of typical Southern white woman meant to represent the upper class, even though she's not really upper class anymore. Faulkner did the same thing in The Sound and the Fury. That's a novel about siblings. Three brothers and one sister. Guess who gets to be the narrators? The three brothers. The sister doesn't get her own chapter. Okay. Who else doesn't get their own chapter? Matthew. Charlie. Matthew. Okay, Matthew, we never hear him. Now that might be a strategic thing because if we were allowed into his thoughts, we'd give up the fact fairly immediately that he didn't really kill Bo. And I think the novel is largely constructed in order to sort of make us believe that he did, right? Uh, you know, certainly everybody else assumes that he did. Right? Who else doesn't get a chapter? Does Mapes get his own chapter? Sort of obese sheriff? Sort of stereotypical? I kept thinking of uh, uh, Smokey from Smokey and the Band. What's the sheriff's name in Jackie that? Gleason. Well, Jackie Gleason is the actor. But what's the, anybody remember the character from Smokey and the Band? Sheriff. Right. 
B for T, yes. Yeah, B for T. Good call, <laughs> Tia. Tia knows her Burt Reynolds movies, honestly. Buford T. Justice. I knew it was Buford because it was, uh, you know, there was the famous vigilante in the South in the 60s and 70s, Buford Pusser. Remember that guy? Did, uh, you know, The Rock redid his movie, oh, Walking, oh, Walking oh. Tall. Yeah. Um, but anyway, Mapes does not get his own chapter either. So there's at least three voices, and those are the three voices that we might think of as the most stereotypical types of Southern characters that we would get, right? The persecuted black man, the white woman, and the racist sheriff. So we are telling the story from all of these side angles around... And it's meant to give us or to dramatize for us that, that reality is really a lot of different points of view, a lot of different perspectives. Okay. Even the fact that in the shootout scene, that is not narrated by the main villain, who is, what's his name? Uh, Luke, Wills. Luke Wills, right? We don't get a chapter in Luke's voice, but we get it from one of Luke's gang, right? And the idea is, again, that we're getting the story through the people on the side who are going to bear the consequences of whatever happens. Not the perpetrators, right? Or not the main perpetrator or the main actors, but from the side. So it's a very interesting type of narration. And, and, you know, I think in 1983 it was still a kind of unique thing, even though Faulkner had done it quite a bit. It's still a, it's still a, fairly, uh, a, a fairly unusual thing at that point of time. Today, not, much, not, not so much. A lot of novels today are done in this, in this type of format. Okay. Other themes or issues that you saw in here. Other things. Oh, I'll tell you another peripheral character that kind of threw me. Sully. Right? Gil's friend. Why not have the chapter from Gil's point of view? Because Sully was like an outsider, I think. Okay, yeah. Sully, again, is kind of like Lou. He's our camera that takes us into this Cajun community and allows us to see it for the first time the way we're seeing it, right? Otherwise, we'd have to go in there through Gil's eyes and take it for granted, you know? We'd kind of be thrown in there. This, you know, these are these are the, these are the gator hunters, essentially, if you ever watch those shows, right? Right? This, this is a, a, a rough crowd. I liked Fix's accent, by the way. Okay, what'd you like about Fix's accent? Just, like, how, I don't know, I like the way it was written. Like, instead of calling his son Gilbert, he called me Bear. Okay. It's like the French. French. Yeah, well, and you notice the one of the most uh, important words that comes through, it comes through both in the relationship with Gil and his family, but also in the relationship with Charlie and Matthew is... This word, parain, P-A-R-R-A-I-N, right? And that concept of, what's that word mean? Did anybody look it up? Is it like a godparent kind of thing? Yeah, it's a godparent. Essentially your male role model, right? The person that you, you know, is supposed to be uh, apart from your family is your male your male role model. Okay, very important concept because that represents not your loyalty to family necessarily, but your loyalty to community, your willingness to preserve or to stand up for or to carry on the legacy of this particular community. Okay. Other themes or issues that you saw in the book. Anybody look up the word Gary, G-A-R-R-Y? I believe it was 
I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. It's like a veranda. Like yeah. Porch, it's like on, kind of on the, the top floor of the, right. of the house. Okay. That threw me off, too, because I had never heard that word before, but that's a very architectural uh, element of uh, in this type of community. We might think of it as like a, I, I guess, a balcony, sort of like a balcony, I guess. Okay. So there's a lot of local color in this book that you really get, both in the dialect and the descriptions of the very specific sorts of uh, sorts of living arrangements, the way the houses are designed, right? Matt, the way Matthew's house is designed. Okay. What else before we get into the men themselves? Okay. Well, as I mentioned, the main theme of this book and the main theme of a lot of uh, Gaines's writing is the struggle of black men to be perceived or recognized in society as men. And again, that reflects a culture of desegregation in which they have grown up, many of them, because these are, these are men that are essentially born between 1900 and 1925. I mean... This is a novel set in the late 70s. Most of them are in their 70s at this time, right? Charlie is the youngest, and he's 50, so he would have been born in the 20s this time. This is a generation of men who grew up being called boy, well into their own middle age, right? You cannot uh, refer to people that way anymore unless you want your teeth knocked out, right? Uh, and you notice we begin right off the bat with Snookum being told, who tells Snookum that he can't know about what's going on because he's just a little boy? That's Candy. When she sends him to go tell the men to come with all the guns. Right? It's very cleverly laid in there. A lot of these con you know, a lot of these social implications. In the way that they're, the way that they're constructed. What are some of the ways in which these men have been denied their masculinity? One of the big themes in this book has to do with names. Did you notice the way the chapters are titled? Now, in Faulkner's *As I Lay Dying*, every chapter is the name of a character. Right? There's Daryl. Right. Each of the each of the characters their name. But here we have two names. Everybody has two names. You have the name you were born with, your birth name, your Christian name, but then you have the name you are known by. Your nickname. How many of you have a nickname? Anybody have a nickname? Where'd you get your nickname from? Family. Family? Okay. Did you ever have a nickname you really didn't want? But everybody called you that anyway? You just sort of accepted it? All right? Look on page... Uh, let's see, what is this? Page 27. This is where we're introduced to Robert Louis Stevenson Banks, a.k.a. Chimley. What's interesting about Robert Louis Stevenson's name? Banks' his name. He got it from how dark he was. He didn't like why he was that. Okay, that's a very important thing. He, he was named after the writer, Robert Louis Stevenson, right? And for him, that's a cool thing. But nobody ever calls him that. They call him Chimley. And we learn, I think it's his buddy that says this, right? It's not Chimley himself that admits this, but it's his buddy that basically says he didn't like people calling him that. He especially didn't like what people calling him that. The white folks 
and he would get mad and tell them his real name and they would just laugh and go on calling him by his nickname. Okay? So all of these nicknames, in a sense, Cherry, right? They're kind of odd nicknames. Plateau. We have kind of a culture clash going on here. There's two ways to look at this. On the one hand, it's the name you're born in, your legal name. It's your identity in the social world, the world of paper, the world of documents, right? the world of the law. Your nickname is your cultural identity. You either create that yourself or it is created for you, projected onto you by other people. And you have this sort of struggle, I think, throughout the book for many of these men to come to grip with who they are. Are they going to go by you know, their proper name or are they their uh, you know, social name that's projected onto them? Many times those social names are kind of, you know, knocking them down a peg, right? It's not very dignified. Nicknames aren't usually aren't dignified, right? Most people don't have a nickname that's more proper than their actual name. Okay. So the whole notion of the names in here, I think, is very important. You got one guy you named Yank, right? Who's the horse trainer? Okay. What are some of the other ways these men have been denied their masculinity? in one way, like having to listen to candy. Okay. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I think that whole deny Dan, as we've mentioned, that whole dynamic between this 30-year-old white woman and essentially, you know, she's the one that comes up with this idea, right? She's behind it, and she's ordering. Is that too hard of a word? She's telling all of this community of quarters to get down here. Okay, so I think that dynamic, and as we mentioned before, they break with Candy toward the end. And they basically tell her, this is, this is our fight now. Also, did you notice at the very end of the book, it seems like we've reached a, you know, point of closure in the relationship between Matthew and Candy. Because she says to him, the very last paragraph of the book, she asked Matthew if he wanted her to take him back home. He told her no. He told her Klaatu was there in the truck and he would go back with Klaatu and the rest of the people. Candy waved goodbye to them. There's a sense that her relationship with this community has come to an end because these men don't need her to protect them anymore. They can protect themselves. Go ahead, T. Kind of like uh, at the end of Optimus' daughter where she decides um, not to to take the that okay. and just go back to Chicago. That's an excellent connection there. That's exactly what the types of connections we want to make. In uh, Optimus' daughter, Laurel, gives up the past, lets it go. She has the memory. That's enough. That's all she needs. It's a little, it's a little bit different because this one, those objects of her, of Candy's affection, the community is telling her she doesn't, they don't need her anymore. But she lets it go. The last thing we see is her taking Lou's hand, and it looks like they're going to be, you know, their own community from here on out. But you're exactly right. It's a letting go of the past and a signal that there is a a sort of different future ahead of all of these characters. Okay. Some other things that keep these men from their masculinity. Mainly respect, like you, like you said, uh, how they would be called boy or the other word. Yeah. And I think that's what Miss Janie was trying to stress to Snookum at one point, saying, you know, when, when uh, Snookum was 
calling people by their first names, and she was like, no, you need to call you say Miss Mr. So-and-so. Say Mr. Yeah. Or Mrs. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely that sense of, of the, you know, being diminished. Probably the toughest chapter to take is when Mapes first shows up, and what does he do? He slaps around several of these men, and they take it. They don't back down. They don't confess anything, but they take it. And we have one character who's really the sort of black coward of the book, sort of the parallel of Jack Marshall. Jack's the guy that stays drunk the whole time. Who's the member of this community who's the coward, who allows him, the Reverend, Reverend Jameson allows himself to be slapped around. He actually even gets knocked down at one point, right? This is the power of the law, in a sense, diminishing these men, right? I find Mapes a very conflicted character in this book because there are points where he's funny, right? There's points where sort of his sarcastic answers to questions are, or, or his take on events are pretty funny. The joke ends up being on him, of course, because he gets winged and is so obese that he's essentially plunked down in the middle of this firefight, you know, bullets flying all around him, and he can't move, right? And he has to admit in court at the trial, right, that he was, in a sense, out of commission. He's not a hero, right? He's by no means a hero. So he is very much a comic figure, but he also represents that brutal, repressive South and his willingness to hit these men, right, in order to get what he wants, get the information he wants. You know, I think it's a interesting thing to read this book amid all the controversies we have right now about law enforcement and the way black communities get treated, right? And the sort of questions of respect going both ways. Who's got the power to escalate these types of situations, right? So the men, in a sense, are reclaiming their masculinity. There's other ways, though, maybe not so obvious, um, one of the key chapters, I think, uh, is from Roof, and flip to page 90. This is Johnny Paul talking. Y'all remember how it used to be? Remember when there wasn't no weeds? Remember? Remember how they used to sit out there on the Gary, Mama, Papa, Aunt Clara, Aunt Sarah, Uncle Moon, Aunt Spoodle, Aunt Thread, remember? Everybody had flowers in the yard, but nobody had four o'clocks like Jack Toussaint. Every day at four o'clock they opened up just as pretty, remember? He stopped, thinking the back, the rest of us all thinking back. I'd spent many days on the end of Jack's Gary facing that bush. You didn't never catch it opening. It opened while you were sitting there, but you never saw it, like trying to watch an hour hand move a clock. You never see it move, but it's moving the whole time. That's why I killed him, Jimmy Paul says a bow, to protect them little flowers, but they ain't here no more. And how come? Because Jack ain't here no more. He's back there under them trees. This is the cemetery chapter, in a sense. And I think it's really interesting to talk about what the cemetery represents after seeing this video of Ernest Gaines, who goes back and preserves this cemetery so it's not turned into a field for sugarcane, right? So the bodies of the past aren't dug up and disposed of. In a sense, this is not the letting go of the past, of letting go of the bread plagued, right, or of the possessions. This is the preserving of it, because this is all that's left of these people. The cemetery is all that's left of that past, and these characters want to preserve that. 
right? This is where we see the clash between the land and the tractor on page 92. This is Johnny Paul again. That's something you can't see, Sheriff, because you never could see it. You can't see Red Rider with Joe, Jack with Diamond. You can't see the church with the people, and you can't hear the singing and the praying. You had to be here then and to be able to, to don't see it and don't hear it now. But I was here then, and I don't see it now, and that's why I killed him. I did it for them back there under them trees. I did it because that tractor is getting closer and closer to that graveyard, and I was scared if I didn't do it, one day that tractor was going to come in there and plow up them graves, getting rid of all that proof that we ever was. Like now they're trying to get rid of all proof that black people ever farmed this land with plows and mules. Okay. So there's an effort there to preserve the past of these people of this black community that's in a sense being pushed into extinction not only by mechanization but by the taking of the land by these Cajuns right a way of life disappearing okay if you look on page 94 again it's a core chapter I think and it's interesting that it's told from again the perspective and notice that this is not root Speaking. This is Roof describing what Johnny Paul says. I think that's an important thing. Right? All you old people know this already. After the plantation was dying out, the marshals dosed out the land for sharecropping, giving the best land to the Cajuns and giving us the worst, the bottom land near the swamps. This is the exact same passage that I pulled from that quote. Gaines quote. This is the exact same passage. One is Gaines talking about the history of his, of his people. This is his characters talking about the history of theirs. Here our own black people been working this land a hundred years for the Marshall Plantation, but it would come to sharecrop and now they give the best land to the Cajuns who'd never set foot on that land before. Right? reclaiming the place for the dispossessed, the displaced. Okay. You know, it's interesting because this generation belonged to a generation uh, associated with the Great Migration. The Great Migration was that huge influx into the north of people out of the south, of black people out of the south where they went to places like Chicago and New York. We would not have had the Harlem Renaissance if it weren't for the Great Migration because it built up urban centers of black communities as opposed to these sort of spaced out agricultural areas, remnants of slavery. But the, the downside of that is, is that you, know, you had a whole... Uh, loss of the relationship with the land, of the place we're from. These characters are the ones that stayed, and they're trying to preserve their identity through these lands, right? They're losing them to tractors, they're losing them to the Cajuns, they're losing them to progress. So a lot of what is being protected here, and, and it's not just these men reclaiming their masculinity. In a sense, they're reclaiming their community, the meaning of their community. And this is very important, again, because we're talking about a community known as the quarters, which comes from the notion of slave quarters. This is a group, an economic group, whose relationship to the land has always been defined by their relationship to their white employers, whether they're masters or to the landlord. 
The land has never been theirs, really, but they've made it theirs. They've made it belonging to their community. Other things that stand in the way of these men being recognized as men. What did you think of Charlie's sort of transformation? One thing I would note is that um, I keep saying that a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of black black um, male writing is about reclaiming one's masculinity. There's a lot of neat things you can do comparing Gaines to a guy named Richard Wright, who wrote Native Son, a very controversial book in 1940 that depicted a sympathetic black character killing a young white woman, right? And that sort of notion that this is the violence that's going to come if we don't solve racism. Okay. took on the biggest taboo that there was and ran with it. Very famous novel, very controversial novel. Richard Wright also did a book about growing up in the South, a group of stories. His first book was called Uncle Tom's Children. It was about the, the children of the slave generation. Each one of those stories is about a young black man confronting the fact that the South will never allow him to be a man. This is like kind of not really a side topic, but I was just telling Kia, uh, my husband's black, but he's from Maryland. Okay. He's in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So he moved down here a couple years ago and never really experienced like community wide racial tension as we do down here. Okay. And so he was never really interested in like the politics. Oh, wait, of it. he's from where? Maryland and Delaware. As in Baltimore, Maryland? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, you know, they, they have a little bit of racial tension. Now, there, they, but it's, yeah, but it's, it's... It's different, I know. Yeah. It's a different type. Um, but he never really got interested in, like, the politics of it mm -hmm. until we moved down here. And now he's okay. really, like, active and sort of changing that perception. So Good. I think that's a whole, like, place-oriented yeah. idea. Well, and there's a whole lot you can do with the, you know, the... Uh, when we get into the Alice Walker, we'll be talking about interracial relationships, which have a whole different relevance, especially when it's a black male and a white woman in in the South, in the in the post Civil Rights era. Of course, you couldn't do that in the South before the 70s, right, if you wanted to live, quite frankly. But also, you know, the very idea that uh, you know the 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 law that struck down the, the ban. There was, you know, a, a ban against interracial marriage in many states. And oddly enough, the couple that won that was, their last name was Loving. So, you know, you always see uh, Loving versus U.S. or whatever, or State of Virginia, I think it was. But um, that's the landmark case that, you know, took down uh, bans against uh, interracial marriage. All kinds of power dynamics in there. I'll be interested in your perspective on Alice Walker's, as a black woman, her look at interracial, interracial relationships. Because she, honestly, she's not really for them. So <laughs> it gets a little, it gets a little tricky. And there's all kinds of uh, cultural, cultural layers in there. Um, I was thinking about that though when I was reading like like about candy and how you said it's like complicated. Yeah. It's sort of like I think of it as I'm like an ally, but I can't understand yeah. his process. Well, I really think part of what he's doing with the relationship between Matthew and Candy is he's really I mean, think about what of our images of young white woman with old black men. It's always like Shirley Temple and Bill Bojangles, you know. The, it's always that sort of benevolent, you know, the, 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 the white person, you know, is really fond and protective, but the older black man is a, is a surrogate uncle or a surrogate grandfather, right? And he's really, you know, blowing that kind of relationship up and, and sort of saying – 
that there's nothing in this relationship for this sort of black old man at this stage. He's done with it. All right, welcome to our fourth class. Uh, tonight we're doing William Faulkner's Sanctuary, and so we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, spend a lot of time on the various parts of the setting tonight, on the different and the different locations and talk about what's particularly Southern about those, but also talk about sort of the reception of the novel and the different themes. The information on the PowerPoint is a little bit different than what's in the PDF. The PDF has a lot of background material that I've cut and pasted in there, a lot of illustrations for you. So I do want you to download those and reread them. What I'm doing with the PDFs is mainly sort of giving us the outline and the main themes and some of the more uh, formal aspects, I guess, talking about different different issues that are important. But I want to, in the PDFs, get you really reading what other critics have said. Uh, and these are all from essays that you you guys will be using in the next couple weeks on your own papers. Okay, so this will be this will be information that you'll uh, you know it'll sound familiar once you start researching your your papers. So. With Sanctuary, we were having a conversation before class, and I think the general consensus was this novel is kind of way out there, right? It's kind of a kind of a weird one, and kind of icky weird, not kind of bizarre weird, but kind of icky weird. And it is a very disturbing novel. It is, I think it's fair to say, it's a kind of perverted novel in a lot of ways. Uh... I, in retrospect, might have thought twice about teaching it because it is a novel that, that is centrally about rape, and uh, that's an incredibly sensitive issue in this day and age. Faulkner is not sensitive about it. He's being very sensationalistic, and he's doing it, that sensationalism in a way that I think can be very offensive to people. So one of the things we want to do is, you know, be very sensitive to that subject, but we also want to understand why in his own time he would, uh, you know, sort of take this type of topic and, and uh, I keep using the word sensationalize it, but that's really what we're talking about. I would note that in the 1920s and 30s, as we'll see in a moment, uh, he was by no means alone in sort of playing up some of these tawdry aspects. So when we're talking about 1920s literature, uh, in the, uh, and overall, we're talking about topics that were previously taboo to talk about, sexuality among them. Uh, but even stuff like drinking, you know, we're in the age of prohibition, it's, you know, 1929, 1930. But, you know, the attitudes toward drinking are very different than what we would have seen a generation earlier. generation earlier in fiction, uh, a scene involving drinking would have involved what my mother would call a clutch-the-pearls kind of attitude. People would be outraged. People would be upset. But beginning in the 1920s, as we deal with modern, the modern age, things shift. And all of a sudden, writers are focused on depicting the more negative aspects of life. Let's face it. We are dealing with, uh, you know, with, with behaviors that are not socially acceptable. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of cussing. Even um, the very liberal use of J.C. throughout this novel that may offend some of the more religious readers. Um, you know, that's something you couldn't have gotten away with. 10 or 15 years earlier, but uh, with the loosening up of moral standards in the 20s, censorship issues were still around, but people could get away with a lot more graphic type of, uh, type of writing, and Faulkner certainly pushed the envelope. Uh, this illustration, by the way, is from the 1933 movie, it was not called Sanctuary, because Hollywood, the film office, would not allow it because the book was so sensational. They had to call the movie The Story of Temple Drake, 
But we're going to see a couple minutes of it tonight, and the clip is uploaded in Blackboard for everybody at home to see on YouTube. And you'll really get a sense of, again, how controversial this novel was in its treatment of Temple. Uh, this movie was made shortly before the Hollywood Film Bureau knuckled down and began censoring very vigorously Hollywood movies and, and demanding what sorts of scenes could be in films. So it's a very interesting movie. It's what's called a pre-code film because the Hollywood code came in and that, that sort of cleaned up the movies all the way up until the 60s. There's a whole almost 40-year stretch there where, believe it or not, I mean, how many times do we go to the movie today and you feel like you're being machine-gunned with F-bombs, right? That n never happened in those days precisely because there was a censorship office that would read the scripts and say, this can be done, but this can't be done. You know, you can't show this, you can't show that. All right? So, the first question we want to ask, I think, is why did Faulkner write this kind of book? Um, as I say in the lecture notes, in 1929, when Faulkner was 31 years old, he already had four novels under his belt. Three of them published. One, his first masterpiece, The Sound and the Fury, was in the hopper. It was getting ready to um, be published. Uh, and he was very frustrated by the fact that he was making no money whatsoever. He had gotten married, and interestingly enough, he had married a woman, a childhood friend, that was divorced. And in this day and age, that was very unusual. So a lot of Harris, Horace Benbow's feelings, a lot of the comments that he makes about marrying a woman who's been divorced kind of ring, ring with, you know, I would not have wanted to be Mrs. Faulkner and read this novel and hear some of the things Horace Benbow is saying about divorced women. Okay, but I think Faulkner was working off a little, a little steam. Um, essentially, it boiled down to the idea that he wanted to make money. He wanted to cash in his hope, you know, he was living off his parents at a different points. He was working at the, uh, either at the post office in Oxford, Mississippi, or he had a kind of cush job down in the boiler room where he supervised people on the night shift, which basically meant they would have two uh, African-American men shovel the coal and the supervisor would sit in his office and work on his fiction. Okay. But he wasn't making any money. So what he wanted to do was write something that would appeal to a popular audience. Now, by 1929, for roughly five or six years, there had been this kind of explosion of what we would, what we would today call pulp fiction. And that's stories about detectives, mysteries, gangsters, but also romance fiction that was highly sexual. I mean, not explicit in the way that we might think of it, but um, that was suggestive in ways that, again, a previous generation wouldn't have recognized. Science fiction also came about in this period and also became very pulp. I don't see any sci-fi in Sanctuary. That would be the only, the only element of popular fiction that he left that out. Awesome. What's that? That would have been awesome. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, but clearly what Faulkner is doing is he is tapping into a type of pulp fiction that was uh, it was really taken off in this period, and we call that hard-boiled mystery, hard-boiled mystery fiction. That's the type of writing we associate with Dashiell Hammett, who did uh, in this period was doing the Maltese Falcon, and uh, uh, what's the one we did in the senior seminar? Uh, uh, Red Harvest. Red Harvest came out the same year Faulkner was writing Sanctuary. Those of you that take the senior seminar in T4, uh, whether it's in 2016 or 2017, you'll be doing a lot, uh, a couple of these hard-boiled novels. Dashiell Hammett is the main one that comes out in the 20s. A little later we have Raymond Chandler, 
But this is detective fiction as we know it in America. This is not Sherlock Holmes. That type of detective fiction is is uh, comes out more out of a British tradition, although people argue that the detective was invented by Edgar Allan Poe. But the idea there is it's more of solving a puzzle, and the detective is someone who can put all the pieces together. Hard-boiled fiction, and there's a type of it that comes about even a little later called noir, N-O-I-R. It tends to be more about evil and about how human corruptibility can't be stopped. There's a kind of defeatist attitude toward it, within it, that is entertaining in an odd way, precisely because it's not about uplift. It's about showing us the bad side of people and uh, enjoying seeing the bad side. I mean, that's the entertainment of it, is that we are seeing the ugly behavior that would otherwise be taboo. So it was considered rebellious fiction at the time because it was uh, about anti-heroes. Detectives were not emissaries of the law. They were not policemen. Policemen in this period were pretty corrupt in a lot of ways. But what they were doing was they were generally just trying to survive and make money. So Faulkner is watching all of this hard-boiled literature being consumed in, in popular magazines and beginning to leak out into books. People were starting to publish novels like this. And, you know, he, he liked the writing. I mean, it was, he tapped into that sort of suspense and that sort of, uh, it suited sort of his interest in coming up with um, a kind of masculine style of writing. So he was very, had a lot of affinity with it. But he also was mainly looking at dollar signs. And in the notes that I give you, I give you a portion of the introduction he wrote in 1932 when the, a second edition of this book was published. He wrote an introduction to it. And he basically said it was a cheap idea. I was trying to figure out what's the most sensational topic I could write about that might get 10,000 people to buy it. And he came up with a story about uh, involving the rape of a southern belle. And sure enough, all the way up until the 1940s, it was, it was one of exactly two Faulkner books that ever made him much money. Now, from the 40s on, he was kind of came late in life and was praised and began being taught colleges and stuff and was became rich. But certainly throughout the, the 20s, 30s, and into the 40s, he wasn't making enough, very much money off of literature. So he was trying to tap in into uh, a more lurid type of material. Um, and there was a point in the 40s when all of his books were out of print, except for Sanctuary. Sanctuary was the only one of his books that was still in print. The, his second best-selling novel was a story about adultery in the late 30s. It was called The Wild Palms, and you can see right there how kind of wild that might be, right? But that novel was out of print as well, even though it landed him only a few years earlier on the cover of Time magazine. And paperbacks were just starting to be brought out in the in the mid 40s. And so the paperback house, paperback house brought out Sanctuary. It sold almost half a million copies in paperback, right? With cheesy covers on, right? Kind of like this. Right? Selling the sex. They said, okay, well, we've done Sanctuary. We think we can make money out of this other story, The Wild Palms. They could not find a copy of it in a bookstore, even a secondhand bookstore, in order to give to a typist to retype it. They could not find a copy of it. 
That's how rare it had become in only six years. Faulkner had to lend him one of his own copies at his publishers so the paperback house could hire a typist to type it up and get it typeset. Okay. That's how obscure he was at that point. All right. So, jumping back to 1929-1930, he taps into gangster stories, into stories of prohibition, stories of moonshine, but we're dealing with a novel that is about sexuality. It's not about love, it's about sexuality. And there's a lot of discussion about uh, the meaning of sexual assault that surrounds this novel, but there's also a lot of talk about the psychology of sexuality. And, you know, the 1920s are the age of Sigmund Freud, and so there's a lot of discussion surrounding Horace Benbow about, uh, you know, the Freudian interpretation of what he's going through. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight. We have a story about um, impotence. I mean, we have this figure who is essentially, it's, you know, people argue about this, but my interpretation has always been that, you know, Popeye suffers from congenital syphilis. He's, a, he's born with a you know, venereal disease handed down to him. And that's why he is unable, right, to, to uh, consummate his sexuality. And that leads him to all kinds of uh, perversions and brutality that, uh, you know, we'll try to gingerly skate around tonight as we talk about the book. Um, you know, you also have a lot of out of wedlock, you have an illegitimate baby, you have a very violent uh, example of vigilante justice where they burn a man alive, okay, you have a lot of shooting, you have a lot of gore in this book, I mean, it is, it is a very cruel and ugly book in a lot of ways, and quite frankly, initial reviewers were appalled. There's a famous review of this called the, uh, called, uh, the uh, I think it's called The Culture of Cruelty. But I give you a choice quote in the PDF about it. And it basically says that Faulkner is enjoying creating people in order to destroy them. He takes pleasure in enacting this violence on his characters because he hates the South. So, there's an interesting argument to be had about the attitude toward the South that comes through in his fiction. So, let's go through the PDFs or the PowerPoint and talk a little bit about some different issues. Was Faulkner from the South? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Faulkner was born and raised in, um, born and raised in Mississippi. Uh, there's one of the paperback covers to give you an idea of how they would sort of cheese up these books in order, to, in order to sell them. The idea in the paperbacks was you didn't go to a bookstore. You went to a drugstore or a train station, and they would have all these kind of cheesy-looking covers. Uh, and, you know, you're paying 25 cents for a book, something like that. So let's talk about the major themes in this book. Faulkner was born in uh, North Mississippi, spent most of his life in Oxford, which is the home of the University of Mississippi. And almost all of his writing, as we'll see, is centered around um, Mississippi. So, first theme that we want to talk about, Crime, evil, and the impossibility of justice in a corrupt world. This is kind of the central theme of hard-boiled literature, or noir, N-O-I-R, French word meaning dark, right? And the idea is the world is dominated by evil. Good is unable to express itself in the world because it will always be corrupted. 
I think you're hard pressed in this book to find a single good person. Probably the closest one we come to is Horace, and we see how weak he is, right? He gets his you-know-what handed to him in court. He is protecting an innocent man, at least. Lee, Lee is not guilty of the crime he's been accused of. But Horace is powerless to prove it. And a lot of what he does throughout the novel is kind of, Horace kind of is consumed by and weakened by the idea that he can't bring justice to the world. He's powerless. So he is our figure of a sort of man made weak because he believes in goodness or tries to. Even his own sister is a villain. His sister sells him out. What does his sister do to him? She goes to the district attorney and tells him something's going on in Memphis with him that he thinks might win him this case. So the DA, presumably, we don't see this directly, but we can kind of guess, we have to guess, that somehow the DA goes up to Memphis and brings back the temple back to Jefferson. Okay. Second thing, Faulkner became associated with this type of Southern writing, this dark type of Southern writing that has become really the main type of Southern writing when we think of it. It's called Southern Gothic. Southern Gothicism. Now the Gothic was a, you know, that's a type of literature that dates all the way back to the 18th century. Gothic, we might think of as ghost stories, okay, as horror stories. Certainly Poe wrote a lot of Gothics. Mysteries were often associated with the Gothic because there was always the question of, is this murder, is this crime, have some sort of supernatural explanation, right? If you ever see a mystery novel called something like the noise from the top of the stairs or something like that. It's trying to get you to believe, that, oh my gosh, it might be a ghost. And usually what it does is it plays this up and then lo and behold, the butler did it or something, right? What Faulkner does with Gothic by bringing it to the South is he basically says, this is a region of freaks. Southern Gothicism is about the freakishness of the South. We're not dealing with beautiful bells. We're not dealing with uh, Scarlett O'Hara. We're not dealing with Shavara. Gentlemen. The gentleman in this book, the guy who's supposed to be the epitome of Southern culture, is a hypocrite. Gowan Stevens, he's such a gentleman, he abandons Temple out at this old Frenchman's place. He gets drunk all the time. That's how much of a good man he is. Right? So the term that comes to be associated with the freakishness of the South is a term called grotesque. The malformed, the deformed. In a Southern Gothic, you will usually have a character who, like Pap, is kind of a blind freak walking around with eyes like clots. You're probably going to have somebody who's slow or mentally handicapped like Tommy. You're going to have somebody who's absolutely scary, a monster, like Popeye. And Popeye is probably one of the most famous Southern grotesques. Evil to the core, but also just freakish to look at. Right? Short, almost hairless. Right? There's something wrong with him, something deformed. You can see the evil 
Here's a way to think of grotesque. Whatever's wrong with you on the inside, it usually has some sort of physical manifestation. If you're evil, you look evil. You are deformed by the evil within you. So the idea of the grotesque. Then we come to another theme that's very popular in Faulkner, which is exploring class differences and really taking away what Faulkner thought was the false veneer of gentility, southern gentility, ripping off the idea that southern people are friendly and warm and, you know, hospitable and showing that the upper class is just as evil as the gangster class. We have a corrupt DA. We have a, a sister who betrays her brother. We have a state senator who takes bribes and hangs out in brothels who's openly hypocritical. Right. We have uh, Horace Benva, who's supposed to be our one good person, and who's yet feeling this sort of weird, incestuous concern for his stepdaughter. And that colors a lot of his feelings toward Temple Drake as well. We also and this is the most controversial aspect of this novel. We have a Southern Belle, traditional symbol of purity in the South, who is raped by a foreign object, and then who turns into some sort of evil person herself, right? She buys in, she is corrupted by the by her own abuse. And she is essentially responsible for allowing Lee Godwin to be burnt alive. She accuses him in court. Right? And then we have this weird scene at the end where she's in Paris at the Luxembourg Gardens listening to what's supposed to be high class music, right? There's a orchestra there and the description is everything kind of falls off her like water off a duck's back she's become used to the evil in the world or she's indifferent to it at this point there's a lot of interesting psychological analyses of Temple Drake and uh, you know what happens to her is it realistic or not I don't know she's kind of a Patty Hearst type She's abducted and she, you know, kind of in some ways has Stockholm Syndrome, I think you could argue. Uh, but she begins to treat the world with the same denigration and the same violence that was, was put upon her. And that's what Faulkner is saying the Southern Belle can expect in the modern world. As I mentioned before, Sexuality is generally portrayed in this novel as a dark, evil, vicious force. There is not a single happy couple or any, any, any even, even any sense of love in this book. And so Faulkner is dealing with the nature of taboo desires. Okay? nature of taboo desires, nature of perversion. He's trying to shock people with this book. Then finally, there's a lot of comedy in this book. There's a lot of slapstick. We spend a lot of time in a Memphis brothel with a madam and her two yappy dogs. By the way, one of the dogs 
is named Mr. Benford, B-I-N-F-O-R-D. There was a guy in Memphis who was the head of the Memphis Censorship Board that would put a yay or nay if a movie could be shown in Memphis. His name was Lloyd Benford. So Faulkner is taking the name of real people and turning them into animals. That'd be like if I wrote a novel and I named my dog Todd, Todd Strange or something, right? He's being pretty sarcastic about doing that type of stuff. That's supposed to be a joke that readers would get at the time. They would think was, that was funny. Uh, this whole episode where we have these two Snopes brothers, they're such hicks. They go to the big city, Memphis. They don't even know they're staying at a brothel. They're like, oh my gosh, we lucked out. We live in a house where all these women run around naked all day. But then they go to brothels and spend all their money. Right? The very fact that this novel deals so openly with prostitution should be sign enough that you know we're, we're getting in, into some pretty provocative material here especially in the late 20s or early 30s, okay? But the comedy and the absurdity of modern life. I think what Faulkner is trying to say is usually comedy is another element of this grotesque type stuff, okay? The weirdness, just the bizarreness of this, probably the most famous comic moment in this novel is the funeral scene. We have a gangster named Red, and we don't want to get too specifically involved with what his role in the story is, other than to say Popeye essentially uses him as a surrogate lover, or surrogate rapist. Temple Drake is begging him to get her away from Popeye. So do they go they go to a roadhouse and the next thing we see of red is it's his funeral Popeye presumably kills him so the last thing we see of red is all these people at his funeral drunk tripping all over the casket gets knocked over and the little wax plug that is supposed to fill up the bullet hole in Red's forehead pops out. That's some dark humor right there. Some bizarre humor. The final probably example of it, it's not necessarily funny, but it is absurd, is what happens to Popeye. Popeye, interestingly enough, gets busted in what Alabama city? Birmingham. He gets arrested for killing a cop. He didn't do it. Because on that very night that the cop was killed in Birmingham, he was busy killing Red. He gets convicted of killing the wrong guy. And he goes to the gallows. Doesn't care. He's pretending he's too cool. He gets up there. They put the rope around his neck. And he's all upset all of a sudden because his hair is messed up. And he says to the warden, how about straightening my hair? And the warden says, sure. And he hangs him. And that's brutal. That's some brutal comedy. That is some dark stuff right there. Right? So this novel is just, even Faulkner's villains he treats with just the utmost brutality. Okay? Popeye, a gangster, killer, 
is killed right for the wrong murder but he's killed powerless wanting his hair fixed okay so the absurdity of life okay one thing we need to step back and mention about Faulkner very much he sort of sets the, sets the template for the modern southern writer in that all of his fiction is grounded in a single place or a single area okay all of his fiction is set in Lafayette County Mississippi which he calls Yaknabatafwa because that's an Indian word there's a nearby river it's named the Yukona, which is another variation of that word. So he invents the history of his hometown, his home county, through all this fiction. And one of the interesting things that happens is, geographically, we can study Faulkner's fiction through these real-life places. Okay, What he does with specific settings, how he fictionalizes them. Faulkner came up with this line. It's a very famous line. He says, I discovered that my own little postage stamp of soil was worth writing about. Every Southern writer today is expected to have his own little postage stamp of soil. You write about the community either you live in or that you came from. It's your material. He's not like Hemingway. He's not going abroad and, redis and discovering different territory. Okay. Faulkner says, I would never live long enough to exhaust it, and by sublimating the actual into the apocrypha, by turning real life into fiction, I would have complete liberty to use whatever talent I might have to its absolute top. It opened up a gold mine of other people's, so I created a cosmos of my own. I can move these people around like God, not only in space, but in time as well. So he's inventing a whole mythology about this fictional county, and he's treating it as a microcosm, not just of the South, but of America. Okay? So... You can go and it's a whole chronicle of Mississippi history, in a sense. There are stories that talk about the Native Americans being driven out. There are stories that talk about uh, the, uh, his great-grandfather's time, right, where the railroads first came. There are stories that talk about the erosion of the wilderness that occurred over his own life. There are even absurd stories like the one that is always taught in English 1102, Rose for Emily, which is about spinsters in town. And of course what they discover about this spinster is she's lived alone all these years because she poisoned the man she was supposed to marry. And she's kept his remains in her bedroom. That's some Southern Gothic for you right there. Okay. You can map out where the various novels in Yaknapatafwa take place. And the maps follow pretty closely to the real life county. Okay. So sanctuary sort of takes place in the northeastern part of the county, northeastern half. Okay. This right here would be Oxford or Jefferson. Faulkner himself drew this whole map up. And specifically for sanctuary, this being Jefferson, you can see where some of these things are set. Okay. The main thing I think we want to recognize is, and this would be down here along the hamlet, okay. This is where Horace and Narcissa, where the house is, 
Our sister's house is just south side of the city. Okay, sort of in this area. But this old Frenchman place, that pops up in several different novels. He grounds different novels around this one setting. And the idea of the old Frenchman place is it's basically an old abandoned house out in the woods. And over different generations, different things happen. So in the 1920s, it's become a hideout for, for, pro, uh, for bootleggers who are running booze or hooch up to Memphis. Memphis in its day, as we'll see, was a pretty wild place. The old Frenchman's place. This is kind of what the house, this is what the house it was based on looked like when Faulkner was going there, he was discovering. Okay. It's a name given to the plantation originally established by this fictional character, right? In an area, a hamlet known as Frenchman's Bend. This would be like if I set a novel up in Slap Out and there was a real life house up there. I tell you, there. You know, not a half mile, really not more than 500 yards from where we stand, is a great place for a Southern Gothic to be set. Anybody ever gone up the hill, Carriage Hill, taken a left on Goldwaith? Okay, that's y'all's assignment for next week. Is I want you to take a little trip right up the hill up here. Wait, I'm going to figure out which Okay, that's the front of the building, right? So, just on this street, Montgomery Street, go straight up the hill, take a left on Goldwaith, and go all the way to the end, and then look right. Corner of Goldwaith, and I think it's Martha. There's a house up there, been abandoned, dates back to 1850s. Several different people have tried to save it. It's actually two houses built as one. We need a Montgomery Faulkner to do something with that house. It's just too good of a material. Right? It has all kinds of history to it. Right? It's even got a moat around it in a basement. And back in the 60s and 70s, they used to have some pretty wild Halloween parties because people rented out rooms in that house. There's still people around town that will tell you about all those parties. They were kind of crazy. Right? So, you know, there's something exciting about these real-life places, about, about writers using them and then creating all of these maps and all of these sense of real-life locations. And you can, you know, people do tours of these Faulkner sites. Now, this house is long gone, but you can still go down to this area and sort of get a sense of what it what it might have been like in the different times Faulkner was writing about. This novel is a little unusual that a chunk of it is set in Memphis. Faulkner loved Memphis because it was such a frontier town. Oxford was a small, very, uh, you know, stuffy, kind of repressed place. But you could go up to Memphis and you could hang out in bars with gangsters. There's all kinds of stories, and you can see, see this, you can read this as I sort of paraphrase this, but biographers discovered that he and this buddy of his named Phil when they were, you know, when they were in their early 20s, would go up to Memphis, and they, you know, would gamble, they would booze, this is in drink a lot, this is in Prohibition. And then they would go down to the red light district, right, where the houses of ill repute were. And there's, and Memphis at this time was known as the most dangerous city in America. That's what, how wild it was. Okay. So Faulkner would go there and he would just hang out. Now this is legend, whether it ever happened or not, it's true. He would hang out in the brothels not be a paying customer, but he would just go there and drink. 
so the story is, this is his biographer, Blotner, Joseph Blotner, his biographer, claims that Faulkner, poor as a church mouse and not much better dressed, never went upstairs. And even when a girl propositioned him, he played the gigolo at rest, quipping, no thank you ma'am, I'm on my vacation. Now that sounds like too good of a story, to be perfectly honest. But, now, you know, this is an interesting aspect, because I can imagine all of you sitting here thinking right now, wait a minute, was prostitution really this open in this period of time? And the answer is yes. Every city, up really to the 30s, would have a red light district. Montgomery had a red light district. The house that I told you to go look at was briefly a brothel in the 1940s because it was close to Maxwell. Okay. That's the legend anyway. Who knows if it's really true, but that's the legend. There were brothels in downtown Montgomery. You can go back to the papers and see when there were arrests but the idea was, this is a period in time before, there, you know, there's one point in this uh, story where Clarence Snopes says that, uh, you know, that Temple ran away. She ran away with somebody. And he says, probably one of those companionate marriages. This is a period of time, the 20s, when... Uh, you know, sort of uh, self-help people came out and talked about how marriage should be a marriage of friendship and equals. But before that, marriage was really an economic relationship. And it was not an un all uncommon for men, good men, right, to go to houses of repute or brothels because they had this masculine sex drive that was denied to women or proper women. And so they had to go there. I'm going to guess that most of us would probably not marry a man who frequented prostitutes. In fact, if we knew one, we'd probably be pretty grossed out. In our day and age, there's a lot of talk about the fact that they're that it's human trafficking. But at this point of time, I won't say it was socially acceptable, but it was more socially visible. Okay. How many of you are looking at Ashley Madison list to see if you knew the book, by the way? Right? Kind of the same thing. People are curious. People want to know. But in that period, in this period of time, the red light districts were all around. Now, you know, because the definition of marriage changed, because people became more aware of the crime and the violence that come with prostitution, those things, you know, kind of went underground more often, right? Back in the day, you could actually go to neighborhoods. And so Faulkner takes us on a tour. People didn't talk about him, but... but these places existed. Faulkner takes us on a tour of all these red light districts, showing us all of these places, and also color, taking us at one point across the color line. Remember, Clarence takes his nephews, takes them to a black brothel, right? And it's a brutal, it's a brutal chapter that ends because what happens? The boys are kind of shocked and they say well this is this is a black brothel and he waves money in front of him and he says you know what this is colorblind right he's a state senator by the way okay so memphis really gives us allows him to explore this theme of evil and then we get to oxford to oxford square Again, for Faulkner, I think Oxford being a small, conservative town, a town full of family, right? For him, it's a place of repression. It's a place where 
All of this evil lurks, but nobody will acknowledge it. This is the jail that Lee Godwin would have been at. This is the one of these windows would have been the one where the black man who attacked his wife with a razor blade leans out of the window and sings. There's that reference to that guy over and over again. This is the square, right? And there was, in this period of time, a lot of vigilante violence. The first 20, 30 years of the 20th century were incredibly violent in the South. This is the period, as I mentioned last week, of lynchings, when lynchings of black people were most common. Right? Mobs took violence into the hand, in part because, you know, this may sound a little familiar to some of you, in this period of time there were two politicians in Mississippi. One was named Vardaman, one was named Bilbo, Theodore Bilbo. Both of them served as governor at different times, but they were incredibly and unapologetically racist. And they promoted the idea that people of other colors were coming in to take over our country and that white people should not stand for it. Does that sound familiar to anybody having that talk these days? Right? That's one of the reasons I think people are a little uneasy with all the talk about immigration in this day and age because they're worried about this kind of violence breaking out. I don't know that it will break out because I think law enforcement is much more stronger this day and age, they come down harder on these types of things. There's too much publicity, right, if these things happen. But back in the day, the police would allow lynchings. They would allow this violence to be acted upon. Okay. So Faulkner is dealing with that sort of corruption. There is no justice. There is no peace. There is no good in the world. If you go to Oxford today, you can actually go sit down in the square and sit next to the statue of Faulkner they have there. It's kind of one of the things you always are supposed to do. All right. So that is the PowerPoint. And just real quickly, before we turn back on the lights, I want to show you what the movie, The Story of Temple Drake, would have looked like in 1933. And just to give you an idea of how sensationalized this subject matter was, it's about a five-minute clip. Answer me. Yes. Kissing me and double-crossing me, and I fell for it. I got Gabby and spilled my brains, and you were giving me the laugh all the time. No, I wasn't. And now you're going to put the finger on me. Throw all you know to the hay shakers back home. I'm not going back. I'm never going back. Nobody will ever see me again. I'll just disappear. You just disappear. You ain't going nowhere. Sit down. If you can't stop me, I am going. Sit down. I ain't through with you yet. Now, even if you are a dirty little double-crosser, I still got use for you, see? Uh, the internet in this room kills me. You can't stop me! You can't stop me! Oh, yes, I can, baby. I got your number, and you know it. the story a little bit there. I told you not to. I told you not to. 
sure could go out a little while ago with that man that came. I heard the front door slam. Ah, oh, come on, Miss Reba. You're hearing things. What? What? I heard you. Just as sure as anything in the world. I heard it. show you what Popeye looks like in this movie. <laughs> the whole movie's on here. See it. That you know, that'd be a great paper if somebody wants to watch the movie and do a comparison contrast of the book. That's the type of thing that I think we'll be interested in. Uh, but I want to show you the corn uh, the corn crib scene. The murder scene. try to portray the grotesqueness of Popeye. Big hit, by the way. Breaking my skin here. 